Hello, I'm Jason Skill and this is Painting with Skill Lesson 5. In Lesson 4, if you watch that, uh, we were discussing flat mixing devices. So really in these videos I'm trying to help you make the most uh, informed choice about which palette that you may want to use. Artists will use anything to mix in. This is a baking tray, small cakes. Uh, when you look at this, if you imagine this was white, maybe it's made of enamel or it's made of pot, then it would look amazingly similar to this modern plastic version of this kind of shape. I think a lot of uh, palette design comes from seeing other forms of shapes and, and ideas and, and artists come up with something which will hopefully help them paint to a better degree. This really, often used now in schools, was probably one of the most uh, early kind of devices. Containers that you squeeze paint into and stirred it round, or you could make large amounts of washers. Most of the time in schools these are used with maybe a, a large um, squeezy tube of paint which uh, puts the paint in and the teacher will give it to each of the children and they'll basically add water and stir it round. So if we have some paint in here and you stir it, basically the child will be able to manipulate this and have you know, a large amount of blue and the next one might be red and this one might be brown. And whatever they're painting, the teacher can look at it and know that they've got the right kind of colour and amount for the job that they're going to do. A lot of people then adapt this and try to use this for watercolour. It does have advantages in the fact that you can make very, very large washes. You look at someone like Paul Riley, he uses this kind of palette to good effect. Uh, I found it frustrating when I used it myself. The main reason for that is that when you're mixing in a container like this, it's a bit like mixing in a small bucket. And it's difficult to see in it without there being some element of shadow. And when you get shadow, you basically drop the tone down perhaps a tone or half a tone so you think that your color is actually darker than it truly is the other thing is if you're looking into an amount of water it will look the color will look darker so if i take the same color that looks dark in here and i place it on the flat area it looks paler than it does when we look at it in the bucket so what artists have a tendency to do is to mix the color and then they're, they're working it on the side or they're lifting that out and they're putting it on the top to test the colour or they're using a separate piece of paper. Um, the other thing if you take the kind of school mixing idea if you're going to put your paint inside one of these containers and then you add the water to it what ends up happening is that as you add the water and you put this flat the water in the container then dissolves the paint so it's very hard to control how much paint to water you have unless you only need small amounts. If you need larger amounts then you inevitably end up stirring it and then gauging the amount of paint that you've made or how much colour needs to go in. It can be quite difficult. So artists will maybe adopt a different method. They will, as I did, end up putting the paint not inside the container but actually on the top of the mixing tray and then when they want to make more they'll take that colour and they'll put it inside the dish so that they can make their wash in there whilst adding the colour in small amounts and controlling how much colour is added to the wash area. It's a bit like the same trouble I feel when you're using a pan set and you're picking the colour from here to then control it to there. You're doing the same thing here. It doesn't seem to flow from working there to then going in this bucket. It just, it, to me, it just didn't gel properly. So in the end, I, I abandoned it. One of uh, the most well-known, and I would say a very effective mixing method, is the slanted well tile. Tile, because it's often made out of pot. Uh, there are separate wells, and it's slanted. So each one of these wells has a slant. The idea of the slant is that, as you can perhaps see here, where the paint uh, has collected, it's darker. But if I wanted to see what the colour was, I can pull it up and check its tone. So I don't have the same problem I was having with the, uh, the small bucket container, because I can see what the colour is more easily by just pushing it up the slant. It was initially designed, I believe, as an addition to a pan set, because You'll make colour and then you know you've used say these three little um, containers that come the pants that come with the um, the palette that comes with the, the set. And then when you want to make extra, 
let's say you want to make a larger amount, it was easier to control it in a well. So you could place water in a head if you wanted to think I'm going to make a big wash. So you could add quite a bit of water using your brush or a pipette into there and then you would rub the colour in the pan set and you add it to the water and you create the wash and you can check what colour you've really got by pushing it up the slant to the top. It's a good system. Where it begins to fall down as a palette is only really if you start to try and put tube paint in it. It's not really designed for that. It's designed as an addition to a pan set or a lot of people use it to dilute ink. So they'll take a much uh, heavy amount of ink that's straight from the tube, say, and they'll put that into their first um, well. And then they may add some water in the second well and then in the third and as it goes on and they'll make it paler and paler and paler. There's no um, amount of paint that's come out of a tube, it's all liquid. As it is when you're dealing with a pan set, you're dealing with either colour separate and then liquid. It's designed for liquid, it's not really designed to be working with tubes. If you do work with tubes, you end up sticking the paint at the top, because that seems the logical place to stick it. And then as you add water and dilute the tube colour, it then very quickly makes the wash, but it also bleeds from the paint down into the, into the uh, wash area that you've created. Some people, because they don't like that, will stick it into one of the other little rounded areas, and then they lift it from here and they mix it. Again, we've got the same problem. How much paint have I got in here? You can see I've got a great big lump of paint I've picked up by adopting that method, and then I'm trying to work it through the brush and it's not a big area to do that with so it's difficult to to gauge how much am I going to pick up to then carry. If I keep accidentally putting water into this I then dilute this the source. The squeezed out paint becomes diluted and it's not uh, as easily controlled either. So although I did use this for some time, I used to use two or three of these, um, I found it frustrating because there was nowhere to put the paint that actually seemed to be logical in relation to this because it was never designed for that reason. I thought I'd got round that when I found this palette. This palette, uh, which um, I think I found in the skip, um, was basically at some point a school palette. A few years later I saw this actually, a, a pile of these in the school, I think just like the the round dish palette. It was one of those that was made for sort of mass produced from the school. And what I thought was advantageous about this was that you could squeeze the paint here. I didn't really use this top section very much. And then you had at least somewhere to manipulate the paint. So you could touch the paint at its edge. And as you know from other bits of video that I've been uh, talking through, I think the logical way to work with paint is that you take the paint and you actually work it from its edge and then you can minutely adjust the tonality and amount of paint that you're adding rather than pulling it from somewhere else to wherever you're mixing. And here I have, so I've got this area to work on the flat and then I have an area with wells at the bottom, maybe not as well, dis, you know, separated as the pot version, but still there was a separation that could be used. So I could take that put a load of water or paint in here and I have a well area so I can pre-mix, I can make an amount of paint that's uh, to a volume or quantity that I, that I know rather than it be on the flat where it's difficult to judge and then if I want to manipulate the paint even work a little bit more sticky or add extra to it, it I had an area ahead of it. To me that seems much more logical. Mixing other colours, I could tease at the edge of them, alter the colour deal with a wash if I needed it, or more flat colour. And to me this palette was um, part of the thinking process that helped me design my own palette later, that you separated to some degree the ability to make a wash and control the paint, but keep the two separate. So rather than the paint being butt up against where the, the wash was created, you actually pushed it further away, giving yourself space to make it move. Um, but I thought that this design could be improved upon, which is why I ended up with the design that's in my own um, palette. But it was, it, was, it was a good logical palette to play with for a while. 
There is another palette on the market which, you know, those of you who are watching this and know anything about um, palettes will be thinking, oh, he's forgotten all about the daisy palette. The daisy palette is a round palette and it looks like a flower, hence the name daisy. It has a uh, a container in the middle and then containers round the outside. The idea of that was you put an ink pot in the middle of it, as far as I'm aware, and then you take the ink, again we're just dealing with liquid, and you put that into one of the daisy uh, flower petals and you'd then add water to it and move the, that round so you'd circulate it round the pot, diluting so you could control a whole series of dilutions and varying um, concentrations. And that would allow you to do some painting where you could control the dilutions not designed to be used with tubes really again you'd have exactly the same problem where in this daisy shape are you going to put the tube paint without it then just feeding straight back in you're going to have to need your paint elsewhere to then add and dilute in that daisy palette why would you use containers well let us imagine that you are going to mix uh, an image say for a sunset and you're going to start with say a pale yellow and then it's going to move through to a red, and then it goes kind of orange, and then it goes, say, deeper red, and then it go, might go kind of grey-blue, uh, and in the foreground it might be almost kind of a russet's colour. Well, you might think, oh, hang on, I'm going to mix each one of those colours in a separate container. So I've thought all of my colours through, and when I want to add them to my picture, I can literally dip the brush in the one that I need, one after another. So you're thinking ahead. Container mixing allows you to plan far more than mixing on the flat where you'd have to mix the colours, you can probably only mix two or three and then you have to wipe up and then mix new colours and it's very difficult to work out exactly how much you've made. If you want to make a big wash, it's difficult to make that wash to the exact colour you want, to the exact quantity that you want on the flat. So that's why you would look at container mixing as an option to control and perhaps expand how you going to be able to manipulate paint with watercolour. In the following video, I'll be talking about the development of my own design, why I designed it, came up with a shape that I did, so that you can combine flat mixing and well mixing together. That was video 5. In video 6, we'll be looking at my palette. I hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, if you'd like to watch any of these videos in series, then please go to my website, jasonskill.com.